And welcome inside episode number 65 of Breaking Bats presented by Not For Long Media. My name is Justin Ayers and the boys are back. It's Colin and Jack here to talk all about college baseball with a little MLB sprinkled in. Uh, boys, Colin, we'll start with you because you got the Gators jersey on. How are you, sir? Right, Jack's flexing his Penn State zip up like it's the equivalent of a college baseball jersey. Like, come on, dude. I'm doing great, Jay. Thanks for having me on. It's great to be back with Breaking Bats. I have way more fun joining everyone else's shows on our media network here than doing mine. So um, I could be probably someone more closer to myself instead of the media version of myself. If that makes sense. So yeah, let great your hair to be, down. Yeah, my hair's down. It's great to be back. I get to put on a jersey. So good to see you, pal. And Jack, we'll come to you because the Penn State Q-Zip. It's not as cool as the, the Florida Gators baseball jersey, but it's still cool. We're not, you know, nothing against yeah. Penn State here. Uh, it's always good to see you, buddy. How are you? I'm good. I'm a little offended. I mean, Colin's producer kind of just shaming his own show there. It's like guy says producer, well, like he, he's not my producer. Okay. <laughs> he's a co-host. There's a difference. Producer, I produce the show. It's, yeah. But I run all the producer. other every other behind the scenes aspect I it's control. Not a, it's not a producer. Maybe director. You're director. I'm the video producer. There. We'll get a little specific. Hey, there. let's clap it up for Jack Connell. Already hijacked the show. Breaking bats, everybody. Love the show. Look at the hats. Check them out. Notforlongmedia.com. You have beautiful Not For Long Media hats as well. But these hats are legit. The 47 brand. They're smoking. They're smoking hats. Only the best. Yeah, 47 by four makes the best brand of hats. It's I, I, all of my dad hats. And yeah, it just it's the best. Um, okay, we'll start with a little MLB before we get to college stuff. I wanted to – there's nothing I love more than just knee-jerk reactions to new uniforms. And the Texas Rangers provided us – just an absolute gem of one for their City Connect uniform. For the Metroplex is what they're calling it, the DFW, the Dallas-Fort Worth area. It is, if you haven't seen it yet, check it out. Uh, it's pretty weird, but I, I sent you guys the picture of this. I'll just give like a brief overview of what it is because it's it's something. So it's black pants with striped socks. The It's got a, a, a mythical creature on it that they created called the... The Peagle. The Peagle from two old Rangers minor league teams that I don't think exist anymore. Um, it's got a, a Gothic lettering that I don't understand. Why. It's just the weirdest looking thing. That is my take on it. But Colin, uh, you know, I'll, I'll come to you first for this one. Do you, do you like it or not? You know what it looks like? The New Jersey Devils came up with a jersey, black with like white pinstripes. That sounded great on paper but it just does not look good on the human body. There's a pair of cleats this year of the NFL we wore, and they look horrendous. But you put them on, and they're extremely comfy, and they look good on the human body. But off the human body, they do not look good. They're the, one of the newer Nike cleats. I love them. Love wearing them. They're great. But these are rough. I mean, listen, the way our world is today, it's really easy to hit home runs when it comes to design and fashion and style. Have it make sense to the eye and then insert all the cool stuff after. It looks like they wanted to put all this cool stuff for the Maxroplex in first and then figure out the colors later. It's just, yeah, it's just not, it's just not ideal. That's my thoughts. Jack, what about you? I, I like certain segments of it. I don't, I'm never a fan of like the different, I like when everything's pretty much the same color, mainly the jersey and the pants. I, it doesn't look right having, the jersey being cream, off white, whatever you consider, which I think is incredible. I'm a sucker for those off white types of uniforms, but I don't like the black pants being paired with it. If it was a cream pants or if they did black on black with like, I think it would look a lot better. I just, it just doesn't look right to me. The hat is killer though. I feel like that hat is going to sell tremendously well. It's just a cool design. Like that, I don't know if that it's supposed to, I know it's the TX. I don't know if it's supposed to also be like a D for like Dallas or something, or if it's just TX next to each other, but it looks really cool. I'm for it. I just have a boat. I don't, I don't know if it's just because I'm spoiled with the NBA, but I don't like the fact that th there's only seven teams get an alternate jersey like every four years. So, I mean, it, mainly because it's as a Phillies fan, or I don't know if you really consider me a fan since, since how little I pay attention to them. We haven't even got one yet. It's been like five years. I don't even know if they'll even get one next 10 years at this point. And it's just, I don't, the NBA, they get two new ones each year, but. That, that's my gripe with Nike City Connect. I've, I've liked a lot of their designs, though. 
Yeah, I mean, I just feel like they had, like Colin said, they had so many ideas for what they wanted to do that they just like vomited all over these uniforms and put eight different things. Like to have the TX next to the number side by side on the front looks bad. The logo, I still can't tell what letters those are. They came up with a mythical creature, which sounds good in theory, but doesn't really make sense to what the Metroplex is. They could have done so many other cool things. And also there's a vertical pinstripe down the pants, but horizontal stripes on the socks doesn't match at all. Um, and I just, I, I like having strong takes about uniforms, but like I follow a bunch of their beat writers and one of them tweeted out, his name's Evan Grant. He's like, I also don't, uh, I also know how hard these designers worked on this challenging task. And I don't think the knee jerk reactions like garbage or trash are productive. It's like, it's the internet, bud. It's the internet. It's, it's, I get it. Listen, it's like people saying that guy should have caught the ball and then like, no, he's, he's, a, he's a human. Okay. Well, obviously, right? Like we know that that goes without saying we're not judging the person's character. We're just looking at the product and saying, this is this, this is that that's a vomit. In my opinion, um, you go with all black, you go with all white, like Jack referred to. It's real easy nowadays. Just go with all white. Everyone loves all white with a color. It doesn't even matter. The Gators, the Friday night jersey they wear, it's all white with the old school lettering. Just do that. It's a home run. They don't have anything on this jersey but this and an SEC yeah. patch. So, yeah, just keep it simple. Keep it simple with, with jerseys and uniforms and apparel. What do you got, Jack? I don't, nice hair I don't know if this is the right phrasing, but in the NFL, I would say bullying works. But, for example, the Chargers. The Chargers, I don't know if you guys remember, like three years ago, they had like that L.A. Dodgers looking logo. And it just got destroyed by every single media company and person in the planet. And they changed the logo, and the Chargers, since that change in the new logo set, have a top three uniform football. Like, they probably wouldn't have had that if millions of people didn't outcry saying how ugly the L with the lightning bolt dangling from it was so ugly. So, uh, I disagree. That I think they have better needed. players. I think they traded for Cleo Mack and Bosa. Mm -hmm. They signed, and I, Herbert became one of the best players in the league. And What does that have to do with jerseys? I'm talking about you're talking about the Chargers, correct? The LA Chargers. You went in and yeah. out on me. Yeah, I said the Chargers have a top three uniform football. I'm talking about sales, or you just it's opinion. That's your opinion. Just looks like it looks no, like that's your opinion. Yeah. It's not a fact. Yeah, I didn't say it was a fact. Oh, okay. So I'm thinking like top three in jersey sales. No. <laughs> so you're okay. So you're so basically your opinion, which has zero merit because like unless you're like and then to do it, but I don't mean it in a negative way. But I'm saying zero. Like it's not like you're the jersey designer for Nike. You know, no, no, okay, okay, fair enough. I'm thinking, like, <laughs> oh, their jersey sales are top three in the league now because they changed their not <laughs> change their deal. I love you, Jack. You're the best. <laughs> Nothing's personal. God, we we're sensitive. 2023. What do you got, Jay? <laughs> Keep it moving. We got the Oakland A's uh, up next. The Oakland A's are planning a reverse boycott on June 13th because the, the fans out in Oakland are so pissed with the owners and the management of their franchise that they, they want, they want to pack the stadium full to prove that they're not the problem and that it's, it's your guys's problem. Um, so instead of a boycott really, Hey, nobody show up. They're already kind of doing that, you know, on their own anyway. So they're really what they had to do a reverse boycott. Um, it's like, Hey guys, we still like this team despite how bad you are and how poorly you treat us and how you make us play in a dungeon. Um, so it's, it's an interesting concept. Uh, Oakland hasn't been relevant in major league baseball in, I don't know, about a decade they're dead last in attendance and they're good they're they have like three wins this year um so i thought this was interesting what do you guys think about a, rever a reverse boycott turning the tables absolutely love it it's taking the you know the fandom in their own hands saying hey listen yeah we could show up and fill this ballpark you can don't threat you can threaten to move it all you want because of the fans aren't supportive but that's not the case we are going to show up we are going to support it seems like it's countdown to when the teams move to Vegas. Is that right? I mean, the project of Vegas works extremely well. You see how beautiful the stadium is for the Raiders. You see how beautiful the arena is for the Knights, how successful it's been from a fan participation locally. And then also when people come and visit, it's a, it's Vegas. It's a show. It's an, it's an addition to now, the circus and a or a dinner and a move a show or a movie or whatever's going out in Vegas. Now you have pro sports to go along with the gambling and the partying. So baseball, 
80 something games a year they're going to have there. That's 80 more events that people can book. Also it'll be probably indoors. It has to be indoors. So in the summer, people can go to Vegas and go to an indoor baseball game. So it's a countdown. It seems Jay, do you think that's been talked? I know it's been talked about a little bit, but is that in motion? Yeah. So I was looking up when you're saying that the, the Oakland A's lease expires soon. I think it's after next season. And the Coliseum that they play in, it's by far the worst stadium in baseball. Maybe the worst stadium in in sports history. I don't know if you saw this over the weekend, but they they had a possum in the visiting team's TV booth. The Mets were in town, and so they had to, like, the the SNY people had to go to a different location because there was just a rogue possum living in the the bowels of that TV studio thing. It's disgusting, but yes, Vegas is being thrown around. Um, They, you know, they have made a, a pitch to the athletics saying, Hey guys, we'll give you what Colin's talking about the cool indoor stuff. But um, yeah, it's, it's, I don't think enough people are talking about this Oakland A situation because I think most people would just forget about the Oakland A's, unfortunately, <laughs> unless you watch Moneyball. Um, but Jack, I don't know if you, it my TikTok has just become clips of that. So I don't hate that, yes. but um, Jack, what do you got? So I mean, a few things based uh, on the story of the A's, I mean, I grew up kind of enjoying the A's, the history of them, because actually in my town, I don't know if it was a thing that just people had. We had a Philadelphia A's museum. It was just like a strip mall. It was just the Philadelphia A's museum. Not and a strip it had, club. No. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> but like they had like all of the old jerseys, like the 1910s, 20s, all this old memorabilia from there in Philly, Connie Mack and all that stuff. It was the coolest thing closed down for a ski shop when I was like 10, but like, I remember that. I thought that was the coolest thing. They were a team I like kind of rooted for as a kid. Anyways, I think this anti boycott is the stupidest idea because they have a good idea. They just fumbled back. What better way to sell your owner? You're mad at them than by putting money in their pockets and going to the game. I feel like you could get the same point across by just having a massive tailgate outside. Say, be like, look, you could have all these people in your stands every single night if you had a good team, but we're just going to stand out here for free. Like, it's just, I mean, the best example of showing that small market teams have massive audience, Sacramento Kings made the playoffs for like the first time in 20 years. They're, tick- they're playing Golden State, who probably is the largest reach of any NBA team in the world. It was packed to the brim with Sacramento fans. Almost no Golden State Warrior fans in sight. And the streets outside of the game, mid-game, were about seven deep outside the stadium rooting for this team. I mean, that's Sacramento. I feel like Oakland, tenfold for a playoff game. Moneyball, Brad Pitt, Jonah Hill, like that like that story of how you can get teams to sort of come back with whatever. Like, I don't even think they need to put that much money into the team. Like, it's just whatever. That's I wish Jack long. brought this juice to my show. Jesus. I mean, that was excellent, 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 really well done, Jack, for my semi-professional opinion. That was excellent. I mean, Jack won, Colin zero. It's great. It's a good point. I, I didn't think about that. We're, yeah, we're just, you're just going to pack the stadium and, you know, give the, the ownership the money that they probably don't have a lot of. Yeah, that's, or you could just do what Jack says and just have a giant tailgate in the parking lot. Maybe pay like the $8 parking and then just not go inside. So Jack kills it, but then again, he fluffs his jacket. Like it's Penn State. Like what? It, it what was. You... I was to go back to you making fun of me. So I was was reiterizing the meme of me just flexing a random long sleeve jacket polo. I don't even know what you would consider this thing. Is it All right, we got college baseball. What do we got, Jay? <laughs> I like that though. All right, guys. Well, yeah, we do have a little college baseball to do. We have the things of the week here. We interrupt this episode to bring you a word from the official sponsor of Not For Long Media and the Breaking Bats podcast, the original Fudge Kitchen. It is a staple of the Jersey Shore with six locations in Cape May, Wildwood, North Wildwood, Stone Harbor, and Ocean City. The original Fudge Kitchen makes all of their fudge in-store guaranteed a delicious product, so stop by and let them know that Not For Long Media and Breaking Bats sent you. Check them out online at fudgekitchenswithans.com as they are shipping fudge and sweet treats all across the country. Now back to the episode. Let's start with story of the week. Uh, Colin, I have Florida baseball as my story of the week. I'm assuming you have Florida at some point. Um, would you like me to set it up? And also, do you just have it as one of your things of the week? I don't, I don't. Oh, Florida, oh. not one of my okay. moments of the week. The moment of the week by far in baseball, especially college baseball is John Plumley, the quarterback and also the stud for the use. CF Knights baseball and football team. He went two for three in a triple for two RBIs during Friday's 12 to three win 
over Memphis in the American Athletic Conference. A great conference in that. But in the seventh inning, he had to roll out and go play quarterback in the spring game. So that's by far. Big props to John Plumley. Big props to the dual sport athletes out there. And then also props to the athletic department and the coaches from both teams, allowing him to do both because that's just fantastic. He's in that great video. If you've never seen it, guys, he has this great game. His teammates are all giving him high fives, this whole thing. It's almost like a guy at the trade deadline who's leaving. He gets, quote, unquote, traded the football team, gets in the golf cart, the recruiting golf cart for the Knights, and they're off to the to the football game. I wonder if he had to do stretch, warm up. Probably not. He just probably went out there. His arm's already loose. And last year, I was dialed in on some of his stats here. I mean, the guy had a massive year last year as the quarterback um, for UCF. So, to me, the story of the week is John Plumley doing both baseball and football. I didn't see that one coming. That was fantastic. Uh, I've already given mine away, so I'll just do mine really quickly unless somebody else wants to. Yep, Gator Baseball. Um, on Sunday, they had a, a series clinching win against Georgia. They won 11-6. to That wasn't the story, though. I don't know if you saw us on Twitter. Florida closer Brandon Neely, he got the, the Gators out of a bases loaded jam in the eighth, came off the mound, pumped his fist, and screamed into the Georgia dugout. And then the umpire tossed him. And apparently it's a rule that if you do that, you get a four-game suspension. So now he has to miss the South Carolina series. What? Uh, so, yes. Johnny <laughs> Mack, fan, yeah. fan of the show, he would never play an entire season there. He would have been toast. He talked <laughs> he talk more shit than any player in the world, but continue. <laughs> I don't know if that's a new rule or what. but <laughs> Definitely. I, I read that. Yeah. It's, hey, you know, we're getting soft. But – the, the funniest part of all of this was uh, that bottom of the eighth inning when Florida came up to bat, uh, Jack Caglione hit a grand slam, and then he didn't want to get ejected for an intense celebration, so he just kind of locked up and did a straight face walk back to the dugout. It's great. Uh, what, a, what a scene. Make fun of the NCAA as much as possible, please, because it's irrational. It's, it's, it's stupid. It's stupid. It's like saying we're going to suspend the, the 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 lady from Iowa and the lady from LSU women's basketball programs because they talk smack in the middle of a basketball game. Come on. <laughs> a pitcher struck someone out the bottom of the, the inning, and he – come on. So, I digress. What do you got, Jack, for your moment of the week in college baseball? That oh, was my moment. That's why I gave my little uh, reaction there. That was my moment of the week. It reminded me of Andrew Hawkins. Do you remember the Browns wide receiver who had like the touchdown? He like walked like robots, put the football down, and he just walked right back. That's he exactly got fine. where he probably got a thick fine. People don't realize too in the NFL how much people get fined. Everyone's like, oh, they got money. They're like twenty thousand dollar fine. <laughs> Guys will play for free. Plus, you buy your family, you know, four or five tickets. Like, God, that's a free paycheck that is not fun so yeah no it's pretty I mean, funny i guess you could say my player of the week i guess is also I mean, it's specifically a moment a week for a player lsu his name jared jones i just love this part of baseball because it's very similar we're talking about florida he had some words of encouragement for the pitcher after it was, <laughs> at the, it was a home run i don't know if, i don't think it was a grand so i think it was just a home run what do you say jack we'll say it, jack I, yeah, we're, we we can't. Is this a kids program? You can say what you want. <laughs> Don't say it. It was, uh, it was rated R. It was a hard R. Yeah. Hard R. No. But, um, yeah. 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 But yeah, he had some words of encouragement on his MF. home run trot. And I just love when players just get really excited and jaw off in a game. It just makes it fun. And that's just what I hate about this whole Florida situation. Wasn't there another player earlier this year who had like a bat flip? I don't think, I don't know if it was D one, but there was a player somewhere who had like the tamest bat flip and he got ejected too after a home run. So I don't like that. This is becoming like the no fun league for baseball. So I'm just really wanting all this. Stuff. Like Joe Kelly. I've, I've never watched like any Joe Kelly highlights, anything, but the fact that he did like that shut up like that. He's my favorite player in baseball just because of that. Like we we need more of that. We need Bryce Harper being Bryce Harper. Like that's why he is so great in Philly. There needs to be way more of that in baseball, especially if they're trying to reach a national audience and get more eyes on social media and ESPN. They need to start doing this stuff. NBA, that's the reason the NBA is so popular. Look at Dylan Brooks, LeBron, Russell Westbrook, all these guys yelling at each other. Because that's what it's a bore fest in the regular season. It'll be fun in the playoffs. 
look at that's what I'm talking about. For the, everything I just mentioned is from the playoffs. Russell Westbrook walking into a fan suite after a game in the playoffs, tell well, that's him to shut up. That's irresponsible. That has nothing to do with anything. It was during the game. <laughs> talking about smack. The guy's in there. Well, no, get- and then also LeBron doing Dylan Brooks like walk out in the middle of a game. And then also listening in on Dylan Brooks timeout, just going back and forth with them game one against the Grizzlies. Like That's it's good great. Stuff. But I might think you get more juice in college baseball regular season, in my opinion. Bat flips, more smack talk than you do in the yeah. NBA. Well, that's what season. I'm just saying. Like the reason, like the way to get more eyes on baseball is by doing that stuff and allowing it. Correct. I don't necessarily say encouraging it, but not discouraging it. I think it. people in the golf world are trying to they love that, right? Like the drama of Brexit Sham yeah. beefs, right? It's a whole thing. So I digress. What do you got, Jay? Uh I have a player of the week for you. That's a really, really, really cool story. Uh, Florida Gulf Coast outfielder Brian Ellis. He set the unofficial NCAA record for reaching base in 102 consecutive games. He started this streak in April April 30th, 2021. And so he did the final 11 of that season. He did all 58 games last year and then all 33 games this season. He got on base. I say it's an unofficial stat because NCAA doesn't chart consecutive games reach base safely um, as an official stat. Don't, not sure why. But they had a pretty good standing ovation for him. He held like the base up, like he was like Ricky Henderson or something. So um, <laughs> this guy, I don't know how old he is, if he's, you know, sticking around college baseball that long, but uh, that's a lot of games to get on base. So congrats. Yeah, Sounds no, like I somebody mean, Brad Pitt would love. Uh, Gets on base. Yeah, does get on base. Money you ball. go Brad Pitt money ball for those that aren't keeping score. Back. So uh, it's a good point, Jack. Listen, the coolest part about college baseball is there's so much. Like there's just so much, which is so much fun. Uh you know, Rhett Louder at Wake Forest was going to be my player of the week. The guy's an absolute stud. Seven scores innings, all these different things. He's a monster. But in my progress of doing more research for the episode, Virginia third baseman Jake Galoff, okay, UVA's all-time home run leader. He's got 16 homers in the season, bats 379. Guy's a stud, okay? One of the best players in the ACC. He had a home run. Seven homers in seven games. So we're thinking about a player of the week. The last seven games, seven days in a week, he's had a home run. So, um, yeah, the guy's a monster. Jake Galoff, tip of the cap, the breaking bats cap. Find it at notforlowmedia.com because the guy's had seven homers in seven games. Jack, who you got as your player of the week? That was Jared Jones is my player of the week because my moment of the week was Florida baseball. So I kind of shift things around. So I'm kind of good. We're really, this is is what we talked about when we were saying Jay or Jay and I were talking about, we need to do this live so people can have their things be stolen. So that is where I'm SOL here. You know me prep, throw it out the window, not needed. What's like part of my, what's like part of my take does like who's back of the week and everybody takes each other's and it's hilarious. So like I figured, Hey, you know, in the spirit of that, let's just take each other's. And shocker, who am I going to take for the team of the week? Your LSU Tigers, number one team in the country. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> this team is dominant. I was looking at their their schedule. They have not lost back-to-back games all season. They have won two out of three games in all of their ranked SEC weekend uh, series. They went one and one with uh, – South Carolina because of a rainy delay on a Sunday. Jay Johnson, the head coach there, he said this past weekend the win, 7-6 over Kentucky, a really good game back and forth, was his best win in his tenure there. He's been there two years. Um, Really said he wouldn't want to coach any other team. He loves the mojo, how tight the team is. Um, They're just loaded with hitting. Top players in baseball, we know their names, they're loaded with pitching. Top players in baseball, big transfer out of Air Force, stud, the 6-6 pitcher. Um, so they're now they're learning how to win close games. They have top end MLB talent. They have a coach who's had success and has won everywhere he's been along the way. I know they're number one team in the country. I know it's not a hot take, but they're a team that is on fire. They're a team that is a team of destiny, in my opinion, to really run through Omaha and put some big wins down because they face the best in the country. And they have no one on their roster that's ranked, or no one on their schedule the rest of the season, excuse me, that's ranked. And they just went through a gauntlet of top 25 teams. So. I'm sure somebody will be ranked towards the end of the year, but they have an opportunity here to really pad some stats and get some things going because they just went through a gauntlet and have they been on fire. That's a great one. I have a pretty good sleeper for team of the week. It is your Oregon State Beavers. Shout out Adley Rutschman. 
Uh, they've had an incredible week. They swept number 23 USC at home. They've won six in a row. They've won 12 out of the last 15 in the current D1 division baseball uh, you know, rankings for, for everything. They're, they're ranked 21st. So they, they went from being tied for last place in the Pac-12 to sixth place in the Pac-12. Uh, they have a pitching staff that leads the Pac-12 in ERA in strikeouts. And I was doing some research, and they got the coolest closer in all of college baseball. Uh, his name is Ryan Brown. His stats for this season, he's thrown 18 innings. He's given up one run. And he has a, that's a .49 ERA, and he was already drafted once, so I'm sure he'll get drafted again. So uh, shout out the Oregon State Beavers, my team of the week. I will. I have an interesting team this week. They're not really a shocking team. It's not bad. We're going to go to the Virginia Cavaliers. Virginia is kind of in a team that's like sitting around 15th to start the year, and they had a really big boost up. They had a big sweep against Miami. It was ranked 20th in the nation to start the month. Kind of been on the beat Richmond, St. Mary's. They struggled against Pitt. They got VCU coming up tomorrow. Notre Dame big series coming up, which is I'm now finding out that Notre Dame's in the ACC for baseball. I'm not sure if that's just other sports. I'm a football-oriented person. I just assume that Notre Dame is independent in every other sport like they were football. But, again, they're on an upward trend. They're sitting top 10 in the country. They actually have a pitcher on their team, Brian Edgington, and I figured out after this that actually I went to high school with. I was going to say, he's either either from Happer or Horsham, or he went to Penn State and Hampton first. (laughs) (laughs) But I have Brian's been around a couple D1 teams. He's been doing a good job. But Virginia team's really picking up some pace here. Going to rank top 10 consistently. Can make a push for it. We'll see. Virginia's one of those places that's like just an awesome state school. You know, like uh, it's like a really obviously, and again, it has nothing to do with baseball. It's like they're really solid in a lot of sports, but like the sports like lax and baseball, they're like good at, you know, like it's just unique. It's fun. It's a, it's a good place. Obviously, Matt John's a friend of my show and uh, Chris Long. They have a literally really cool alumni. Um, so random UVA shout out. I like it. Uh, do you guys have a stadium of the week? Absolutely. Okay. What do you got, Jack, in the back? Other than Penn State Memorial Field. Right, I got first. Beaver Field for Appalachian State is my stadium of the week. I took a look at this. This is like the reverse field of dreams. Instead of just cornfields, it's just trees everywhere. Trees. Mountains. Leave Philly. Bad shit happens. Um, it's just beautiful. Like I it, like I literally looked at it. They had the the beautiful A in the middle of the field, kind of nice overhead shot, literally four surrounding it. I don't know what the behind home plate looks like just from the, the pictures I saw, but that's just a really cool view. Like just shooting baseballs, just straight into the trees, not knowing where it's going to go. It's, I imagine the sunsets look beautiful there from the stands. Really unique. I don't know what other baseball stadium is just surrounded by forests like that, but that is my stadium of the week. My stadium of the week is Condren Family Ballpark. At Alfred A. McKeithian Field, the Florida Gators <laughs> ballpark. Go Gators, baby. Let's freaking go Gators baseball. Absolutely love watching them play. What a really cool video. Sports Dissected on YouTube did an amazing behind the scenes, 15 minutes of this facility. It blew me away. So check that out if you want to learn more about it. I think it's worth your time. Uh, was opened in 2021, cost $60 million. Um, Again, really cool place. 7,000 fans, and then they had a bleachers and the whole grass area fits another 10,000 fans. So very similar and kind of standard to the SEC, which is like that 10,000-plus situation there, LSU similar. But the former baseball stadium used to be right near the where the Gator basketball team plays, where the Gator football stadium is, where the Gator track and field is. It was all right there. And what they did was they – Florida facilities, believe it or not, football-wise, when I was going there, even in the last 10 years, have been really archaic. They're the worst football facilities in the SEC. So they destroyed baseball and put a massive football facility on it that drops back to the football fields behind it. They took baseball and moved the next lacrosse and softball, or the orange orchards used to be, and built an amazing, amazing stadium. They have a turf field attached to the stadium where – they can practice, you know, fielding ground balls because they play a lot of teams. I think Tennessee's turf, I think Nash, uh, uh, Vanderbilt's turf. So they have a turf field that's like an infield only. So they can practice taking grounders off the turf. They can put pitchers on there to get them comfortable with the turf mound. And then during games, they have this huge jumbotron so kids can play wiffle ball and all this stuff. And then they can watch the game. So I thought that was really cool and unique. When most places are like tight, 
the Gators had a lot of room out there, and I think they did a really good job with it. They're all selling booze and whatnot in the stadiums now too, which is really cool in Gainesville and something that we didn't have when we were there. But again, a first class facility, like crazy batting cages, the locker rooms sick with a pool table and ping pong and big couches. So again, sports dissected, check that out. Uh, inside the Florida Gators, $65 million baseball facility. It's really, really well done. So to me, that really long name for whatever the ballpark, uh, the <laughs> Condren family ballpark is what they really call it. So it's good stuff. I was gonna say, that's an extensively long baseball field name. I definitely I said it know. wrong. Well, I'm about to say mine wrong too, so it's okay. Mine goes to Mississippi State. It's Duty Noble Field Polk Dement Stadium, uh, home of the Mississippi State Bulldogs. Baseball America called it the new palace of college baseball. It was the 2021 field of the year. Um, it's like, I think it's almost brand new. I think it's like five years old now. Um, the reason why I picked this is because over the weekend, so Mississippi State baseball is not very good this year, and Ole Miss baseball is equally as bad this year, but they just set an NCAA college baseball record for attendance. They had 16,423 fans at a game for two teams that had a combined record of 8-22. and 22. So uh, Bulldog Nation showed up in big numbers over the weekend to a almost like perfectly immaculate field um, to watch subpar college baseball. And for me, that that does it. So um, I love it. Mississippi State, shout out. Um, okay. Go dogs. Yes. Do we have a jersey of the week? I was Googling mine really quickly. Did anybody prepare one? It was not written in the show notes for me, so I will have to do some. Listen, Jack, you don't – listen – we know that's the truth, but you don't bury the guy. Take Penn you know? State Abington. What's their jersey look like? Got yeah, a nice shirt. They got like a nice new one this year. It's got like the A, like in cursive on the one side. The thing that they have introduced and a lot of teams have started to do, I don't like just from I, I get it makes sense from a playing perspective. They have like the shirt jerseys where it's just like the V neck. Like it looks like the Houston Astros old jerseys where it's just like there's no buttons or nothing. It's not a baseball jersey. I don't know what you would consider it. But I guess it's because they're lighter, they're more comfortable. Yeah, they literally have – our school has a jersey that has fake buttons on it. Like, it is a pullover, which is like – at that point, just have buttons. All right, I'm so, going to go with the jersey of the week, Jack, because we're going to move move forward. Go on Fanatics, find your jersey of the week. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to do this the right way. There are a million of them. You can never be wrong. Wow, there's a lot of really good jerseys here. You know, that's pretty cool. Buster Posey, Florida State's nice. The Nebraska is pretty sweet. I love the LSU jersey. I picked UNC last time. Did anybody do Ole Miss? Jack did. Last week? Yeah, I did. Oh, I did, old, I did Ole Miss jersey. baby blue. I think we all did power uh, a form of powder blue last week. Yeah, because you did North Carolina. I did Ole Miss. He did Tulane. Oh, I got Yeah. Okay, so my jersey of the week this week is the Clemson White with the orange tigers and the purple line across the chest that's my jersey of the week this week you gotta love the acc southern baseball all white as the weather gets hot in the south for a great jersey my jersey of the week here on breaking bats my jersey of the week it's going to arizona state the white jersey that says devils across the front it's old school script i love those arizona state colors by the way like they're maroon i'm gonna butcher like the official name of them but like that maroon and yellow whatever they want to call like the you know the school colors of those but yeah i think that's so cool um just just says devils on it simple clean didn't have to be like the ranger city connect to put 30 different things on it no doubt i'm gonna go to the acc for my newly found notre dame fighting irish there i would guess you would consider kelly green jerseys with the metallic gold helmet the gold chrome helmet i guess you would consider it that's just sick. I mean, what other team has a gold helmet that's that like Good. shiny, that finish? Like it's unique. And I'm just a sucker for Kelly Green, you know, Eagles, Philly, just and no. I'm also Irish. So I got the, the the Notre Dame's like everyone's third favorite team. It's Irish. So I'm a big fan of it. I think it's a u- nice, unique design. I don't know anybody, maybe Oregon is a similar design, but nobody else has anything like them. That's a good who's point your, though with the Notre Dame. Who's your first two teams, Jack? I, I just mean in generalities for any Irish born person. I know. I'm I, don't really... I love it. It's good stuff as always. Penn State Abington, I guess you would consider number one and number two. Now, my little league had uh, jerseys, had t shirts with fake buttons on them. So the over, the over <laughs> on Penn State Abington hit in this episode. I thought the over under a 10, it's been now at 11 times brought up. 
listen, I, I know lines. I had the I'm I'm like the what what the Shanghai Sharks that just purposely threw the game. I purposely threw your line. I bet the over on it. It's good stuff, boys. No gambling at Bushwood, and I never slice. No one gets yeah, that. I don't. I, I never got that one. No that's Caddyshack something. jokes. No. You guys are too young. Go watch Caddyshack. <laughs> and go, have any of you seen Caddyshack? I've You're seen like three years older than Colin. <laughs> Jack, have you seen Caddyshack? I've seen decent amounts of it. Bill Murray, The Gopher. If you I don't get... watch it tonight, you'll be let go from Not for Long Media. Watch it tonight. Oh, that's I think he's thirty years you, old. You 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 had that threat with Ja and Entourage, and I don't think that really worked out yeah, too well. Yeah, you watch Entourage yet? No, I was going to, but then I had to take a shower. So I oh. it's only the number one show like rated. That's in the like world a that's a long six month shower. It's okay, though, don't listen to us. Yeah, I was asleep. It's like it's like when somebody's like, "Hey, you know, I'll, I'm sorry, I missed your text. I was sleeping." So black uh, black crow on Apple TV. Started watching that. Uh, Ryan Whitney and Rear Admiral from Spitting Chicklets suggested that. Fantastic. Uh, the Wrexham show is fantastic. Rob McElhenney and. Um, the dude from Deadpool, Ryan Reynolds, Ryan Reynolds, a uh, fantastic show about how they're taking this soccer team in, in uh, Wales to the premier league, essentially from the bottom. It's incredible movie, suge- TV suggestions. And then watch, yeah, watch it. If you haven't, it's a lot, that's a, that's a lot of time and effort suggestion. I don't know that time to type of time, Jack. Ted Lasso season three. Just money started. dude. That's yeah. Money, dude. So TV corner. Good stuff. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you guys. Jay. Yeah, thanks for coming on and talking college baseball every so often. It's I think it's good for the people to stay up stay updated. Because you know, when June comes around and everybody's talking about the college world series, it would help for people to have a little frame of reference out every now and again. Talk a little LSU, Oregon State, whatever. So I think this is good for the people. It's good for the people and the people want it. All right. I'm now joined by a very special guest, former MLB pitcher Steve Johnson. Steve, how are you, sir? I'm good. How you doing? I'm good. I uh, I think it's been a couple years since I've had you on a podcast. I went back and I looked. I think it was like January of 21. Um, yeah. Been super cool ever since then. So I've appreciated that. But um, kind of like the the origin and why I wanted to have you on here for a few minutes was just like, you know, I, we, we talked all about last time, like pitching and fundamentals. And um, what kind of spurred this is I'm watching Grayson Rodriguez go out there for the birds every fifth day. Um, and I've noticed a couple of things and I wanted to get your pitcher's perspective on them. Uh, the first one is kind of like the first inning is I, I've noticed for Grayson specifically is like he he kind of gets hit around a little bit like his very first start in Texas was a little rocky and then a couple starts later in Chicago I think he gave up like a four spot like t- take me through like the first inning for a pitcher like a starting pitcher like is it how scripted and how planned out is it and what does the prep look like for a first inning specifically uh well obviously it's it's different for everybody um you kind of one thing about the first inning is is you, as a starter you've been waiting around all day you know you, you've known your you've been pitching you, you you try and keep your routine the same you try and kind of keep your nerves calm but um you you know today's your day and you're trying to wait all day to kind of get this this time to start and then it happens and you kind of try and figure out what you have that day and it's tough to sometimes get yourself you know, motivated, um, not motivated, but just to kind of get that adrenaline going a little bit more just because you've waited so long. Whereas, you know, I had the, you know, opportunity to pitch out of the bullpen and, uh, you know, as a starter. And when you get that phone call, that was the first time that I ever really felt that because I had been a starter for so long. And I was like, man, like I was amped up from the get go as soon as I, that, that phone rang. Um, whereas you don't really have that as a starter. So that sometimes can be a hurdle that you just have to constantly deal with. Whereas some guys maybe throw, um, they treat like their last couple uh, pitches in the bullpen as a, you know, as like a game situation or at least as a first first batter. Um, just try and get yourself kind of going and get that game situation started. But uh, it's just sometimes tough to kind of get over that hurdle just because you're trying to pump yourself up and then also trying to find what you have that day. And sometimes it doesn't come until the second inning. Do you think for being a younger pitcher, especially in, in the case of Grayson and maybe even in the case of yourself, like do nerves play a factor in, you know, b- maybe being a little bit jumpy in the first inning of starts there when you're, you know, you're in your early to mid twenties and you don't have a lot of big league experience. Do, do you think that plays a role in some of this stuff too? Yeah, I think um, it's, it's one of those things where you're, you're always nervous and anyone that says they're not, you know, when you're walking out there for your start that day, your nerves are going and um, they should be. Um, 
and then once that game starts, it's 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 fine. But at the same time, it's you know you don't know what you have that day. You got to know what type of fastball you have, how the hitters reacting to it, how's your breaking ball that day. Um, you don't really know until you get out there. As much as you throw in the bullpen, so you know, and and he's been pitching long enough to where he he knows he knows that. But doing it in the big leagues is is, is definitely different. You can get away with a lot more in, in the minor leagues, and and sometimes those first innings can be you know, can be the game. Um, and, and it's unfortunate, but I think those are just some growing pains that he's been going through. And I'm pretty sure if you look at his outing after the first inning, you, you'd probably be pretty happy with it. So I think that over time, he's going to, he's going to figure out how to, how to handle that. Do you remember a time back in your major league career that you had a Rocky, maybe first inning there? Uh, do, can you think back to a time like that? And then what did you kind of do to get back on track after the first inning? Well, I can, I can think of, uh, one um at least or i started at home against toronto my second start i had a rough first inning i hit a guy um walked i, I just I had a guy on left change up up just nothing was feeling good and carnacion hit a just absolutely crushed a homer um settled down got out of the inning and then cruised for i think either four or five scoreless after that and, and i think we ended up winning the game um and, and sometimes you just need that first thing to go wrong you know, hopefully it's minor, um, but it's it sometimes just kind of like, you know, like, okay, I can get through that. And then the next inning you go out there and everything is kind of on track. And, uh, you know, as a starter, you're just kind of battling to kind of go as far as you can, keep your team in the game for as long as possible. And, um, you know, whether you give up two, four, five, whatever it is, if you can go five or six, keep the team in it, like you're doing your job. I know now they have like the, the iPad in the dugout where they can go in between between innings and look at like their pitches and how they're moving and stuff. I I'm assuming they didn't have that when you were pitching. I could be wrong. Uh, what was there any kind of technological aid that you would use to kind of like look at between in between innings? Yeah, we had uh, some video underneath. Um, we could go in and, and kind of look at some, some clips and it wasn't right away. Um, but after the fact we could, we could look at it and see our starts and, and, and kind of go through each pitch. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't instant and, and that might help. That might have helped some, some, uh, sometimes looking back, but uh, sometimes you can overthink it as well. Um, you might see something that isn't actually happening that gives you some confidence and, and you kind of roll with it the rest of the start rather than, you know, seeing how maybe bad your pitches are um, and how much you're getting away with. I mean, it could kind of go both ways, I think. But I think in, in a lot of, you know, a lot of times you, you think you throw a good pitch and, and uh, you know, it gets hit out and you're like, no, actually that, that was up or, you know, I, 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 I wasn't a good pitch. I need to kind of make an adjustment there, that type of thing. Also too, I mean, your catcher is probably the most like invaluable source of information for that stuff too. Do you remember uh, who was, who was your favorite catcher you threw to in Baltimore? Was that, I'm assuming that was Weeders, right? Yeah. Weeders is probably, um, probably the guy. Uh, he obviously he, you could have a lot of faith in what, what he's doing. Um, what he's putting down and, and even sometimes when you're not sure about what pitch you're throwing he puts down something and you're like all right well I wasn't I wasn't really thinking about that one but if you think it's good I'll roll with it and you know you sometimes end up in between and and um, you know the catcher puts something down and you're like oh you know I wasn't thinking about that but obviously they're putting it down for a reason uh, they get to that level uh, especially if you trust them um, you know there there's a reason for everything that they're doing um, but at the same time it's just nice to kind of go over and say hey you know, how was that pitch? Was that down? How sharp is this pitch? You know, you're going through in between innings trying to figure out, you know, a pitch might seem good to you, but um, they might say, hey, uh, you might want to roll with this pitch a little bit more, um, you know, even if it's not going well. I, I, the Orioles just have to be lucky they have Adley Rutschman. I'm sure that, like, he has to be, like, yeah, everything I've heard, just, like, all around the best player ever. So um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about was two strikes, pitching with two strikes. I went, I looked at, you know, Grayson's baseball reference splits here. Cause I was, I was watching these games. I'm like, gosh, I feel like he's getting hit with two strikes or like a lot. And he is. And, and one and two counts, he, guys are batting 500 off of him when he's ahead in the count there, it's three Oh four. Uh, and he's given up 10 out of his 16 hits or with two strikes. Um, and that's just fascinating to me. Do you think that's like bad luck or have you seen guys that like have trouble getting, you know, putting other guys away? Uh, that's, that's pretty those numbers are pretty uh, interesting. That that's usually not the case. Um, so I, I think that for the most part, it's probably a little unlucky. Um, you know, he's battled with the walks, so I'm probably 
trying not to lose them, uh, trying to make a good pitch um, without without too good to where they get you know get some swings. Um, a lot of times, you know, you don't have to make that great a pitch. O two one two. I mean, you obviously don't want to get hurt on it, but if you make a competitive pitch, they're they're kind of on their heels a little bit, so you can get away with maybe sort of throwing some some better pitches. And you can tell he has some nasty stuff, so he's going to be fine. Um, but he's probably just working through trying to master that, and then also just limit the walks, make them kind of get themselves out. And I think that you know, past that first inning, you're seeing you know how that goes into effect. Yeah, I mean that's funny you bring up the walks. I had a buddy tell me I think in all of his starts this season, he's walked the leadoff guy. That I mean that like. That just it seems uncharacteristic for him, for, especially when he has like the high nineties fastball and all this stuff that he would be like nibbling or or not trusting in his stuff. But what can you is there like a different approach for like different counts with two strikes? Is like is oh is there a different o two pitch than a one and two? Like it, what what was kind of your approach when when you had you know guys in the count that was like you had them one two two two? Like how did you work through that? I think. For me, I was a little uh, different in terms of I had a fastball that I guess was called uh, you know, a little bit below, but I, I got a lot of swings and misses on it. Um, and I was able to kind of get swings on high fastballs. And so I was very fastball heavy, whereas a lot of people, they go to their nasty curveball changeup splitter. And, you know, I kind of use that to my advantage as well. It's where hitters are mainly focused on kind of seeing this nasty pitch in the dirt where I threw them a competitive fastball a little bit up in the zone, which they already love to swing at. And I was able to get away with it a little bit more. So, um, you know, it's, it's sometimes I understand fastballs are all different. Some guys are able to get away with different things, but, you know, I think sometimes the the guys with these high fastballs, they, they almost fall in love with their all speed stuff and they have 97, 98 kind of, you know, or, or more in the tank and they want to go to all these all speed pitches that are, you know, sometimes the hitter is really looking for it. Um, and they're kind of able to spit on those pitches a little bit more. Uh, so I think uh, what I'd like to maybe see is maybe trying to go after that fastball a little bit more, maybe try and place that in a little bit better, you know, position, um, to kind of use that high, high nineties fastball, and then kind of, you know, use your other pitches to kind of keep them off your fastball. And that's, that's mm-hmm. kind of the goal. So, um, we want to kind of get more into that position of, of using that fastball more and, and attacking with those pitches rather than kind of getting ahead and then, you know, losing those guys. Do you remember what, you know, maybe not like, do, do you remember how much success you had with two strikes? So I went, I looked up your numbers and they're fantastic. I, I mean, I, I don't remember as much, but I, I know that I, I, I like, I like throwing the high fastball and guys love to swing at them. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to have a fastball to get away with it. Um, like I said, I'd, I that's I got O two one two and you're most likely getting a high fastball and then I, I was probably coming back with a, a slow curve and I just used those two things to my advantage for as long as I could. Um but yeah, I don't I don't know those numbers. I just know I got mostly uh probably ninety nine percent of my strikeouts were on fastballs. So it's uh guys hit one twenty nine uh with uh with two strikes and then one seventy when you were ahead in the count. So uh that's 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 a stark contrast. I know it's early in Grayson's career and he's gonna be pitching forever, but I just I thought that was interesting that like, you know, you watch it on TV, you're like, damn, I, you know, these two strike guys are just like they're slapping the ball all over the yard off of them. It's like, yeah, you know, 300 average with two strikes probably isn't you know gonna be the the norm for him. But um, was there ever a time where you had to focus specifically on like specific counts? You know, and, you know when you were pitching. When I was with the Dodgers, they actually gave us um, a a sheet that that told us what pitches we threw in, um, in certain counts, the percentage of, of what pitches we threw. And I was, uh, I think in like Oh, two, one, two, I was very, very high. Uh, it was like 95 or 96% fastballs, um, which I was fine with, but at the same time, I, I, there's different counts where, you know, I didn't want to rely on that all the time. So I, I made sure to mix it up a little bit more after that, just because if they know you're throwing a high fastball, as much as they want to swing, you, you still want it to be effective. So um, that was kind of eye opening in that I was that, you know, high percentage fastball. Uh, but, you know, when you kind of see different things like that, like one, one counts are a big one. Um, you know, you face a lefty. I think I was big one, one count change up. And it, it kind of made me say, hey, I got to mix this up. Otherwise, they're just going to sit that. And that's not as effective. Yeah. So those those things are really important to kind of look at. And if they look at those stats and you, you kind of don't realize 
about it as you're pitching. Yeah, no, that's that's fascinating. Hey, the Dodgers seemed like they, they they were ahead of their time in terms of like analytics. You know, that's I don't know what the regime was back when you were in there, but um, you know, that sounds like they're look they're taking the numbers into account, which is kind of cool. Yeah, um, it, it worked. Um, I think yeah, the the Dodgers were good. I mean, they they gave us information like that, but you know, it advanced so much more after that in terms of just the whole biomechanics and the track man and all that stuff that happened. Um, it kind of just blasted off from there. I mean, they gave us those sheets. They were still sending us paper home uh, with the with the counts instead of being able to look on any iPads or anything like that. So um, <laughs> I think that was like that was before I got traded. So that had to have been 2007, 2008. Um, so things really took <laughs> off after that. Just a couple of years. Um, yeah. But, you know, obviously they have so much more information now in terms of spin rate and all the things they they'd be able to figure out anything they need to know. I love it. Uh, as we kind of wrap up here, I do have a couple of quick rapid fire questions to end this though, but thoughts on the Orioles as a whole, um, you know, you're a Baltimore guy. I'm a Baltimore guy. I've been watching them every single night. What, what do you, what do you think about their chances this season? How are, how are we looking? Yeah, I like it. I think in terms of offense, when, when you can put up numbers on the board, uh, you can be in any game, you get some pitching to kind of work out for them. And I don't think, I think they've just been struggling this year. It's early. Um, you know, I think that if their offense continues, I think they got to just, you know, staying in it. Uh, at this point, you watch some guys, uh, you watch the teams out there. Not everyone's, you know, you know, of course, the their division's playing well. But, uh, you know, a lot of the other teams are supposed to be pretty good. They're, they're you know, right around middle of the pack. So um, when you look at it that way, I think they're they're playing above average. They just have to have some things go go their way in terms of the pitching staff. I think they, they have a good chance of making a good run. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, especially with John Means coming back at some point, too. I mean, that's going to be that's going to be huge. The rotation will even out soon, I hope. But. Um, all right, let's do a couple quick, fun, rapid fire questions to end this. Uh, these will be focused on you and your career. So put the, you know, the way back cap back on there. So um, one batter throughout your entire career that you absolutely owned, you had his number and you knew it. I don't, I don't know if I want to do that to guys. Um, I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I had a, a specific guy that I faced enough that I, I knew that, that I had him. Um, honestly, uh, I from bounced around in a couple leagues. There's, there's not, there's not too many. I can't think of like one specific guy. I know I actually remember all of the guys that had my number, um, but no real guy that, that I, I knew I was like super, super confident on um, or that I faced enough to, to know that, uh, or at least I, I can't, I can't remember it. So unfortunately I, I, I don't know. I don't know one specific guy. Ah, sadly. Well, if you know, I don't, I, I didn't want to ask like who had the most success off of you, but you brought it up. Do you, who, who had your number? <laughs> Gosh, you know, it, it, it this is kind of like a, a an interesting one just because I like Edwin Encarnacion had my number in terms of he hit a homer anytime he hit the ball off me, um, which was in the minors or in the majors. Um, Cause he hit, it was on a rehab start one time. And I think he hit, two homers off me, one being a grand slam. And then he hit two off me in the majors. I'm pretty sure. Um, but I did get him a game where I struck him out three times. So I don't know that day I had his number, but um, he was a guy that when I faced him and we played the blue Jays a decent amount when I got up to the big leagues and, and he, he just, anytime he got in the box, it was just, I didn't know what was going to happen. And most likely if he hit it, it was going to be gone. Um, but yeah, that one, that one day I struck him out three times and I'll take it. But every other time I faced him, he got me. So <laughs> Did, he was, he, was he doing the thing where he put the arm out with the parrot he, when yep, he was running all the, the way around? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's tough. Yeah. That's yeah. Well, he, he did that to a lot of people. So it's, he did, you know, he did. <laughs> um, what was the most memorable at bat of your career? Do you is there is there one that maybe went the distance? Like maybe there was like a high profile guy. What's what's the most memorable at bat? I mean, I guess I I facing the the Yankees for the first time. Um, we were losing the game, but you know I I pretty much had Jeter and A Rod to face and Ichiro and these guys that you know you've watched play for a while. Um, and I was able to get, I was able to strike out a rod and that was, that was pretty cool for me. I had to keep my, uh, you know, to act like it, like I'd done it before. Um, but you know, inside I was like, that was, that was pretty cool. And, um, 
Jeter got a hit off me, and I, I had a nice long at bat with Ichiro where he kept fouling balls off, and then he almost he almost got a single, but Hardy made a good play for me. Um, so <laughs> just facing those three guys in the same game um, is pretty cool to look back at. Um, and obviously during that time, they, they obviously were, were doing pretty well. But um, that, the A-Rod at bat where I was able to strike him out is one that I, that I probably look back at, and it's pretty cool. That's incredible. Yeah, that's that kind of ties into the next question I have for you was what was one player that you were starstruck around? This is it's kind of weird. And I feel like in the baseball world, I'm more starstruck around <laughs> around other uh, other teams, even though we were on the same level, um, you know, at the same time, we're at the highest level of our games. But around baseball, guys, it's almost like you spend this time, especially when you're um, you're moving up and you're being around the, the guys who are who are big leaguers and you're around Adam Jones and JJ Hardy and all these guys who have been there. Um, you almost kind of get used to just them knowing guys and randomly just, Hey, this is so-and-so or, Hey, this is David Ortiz and nice, nice to meet you. That type of thing. <laughs> um, whereas you just kind of act cool in a way because you're at the same level, even though these are guys that you've seen play for a while, but I guess, you know, Mariano Rivera and, and Jeter, you know, those guys just by being an Oriole fan and, and kind of watching the games and they've been around for so long that, um, when, when you're kind of around them or in their presence, it's kind of like, wow, this is, we're on the same level, but honestly, it, it's not the same as when I, you know, met certain like NFL players, like, like an Ed Reed or, or something like that. I'm like, you know, I, I still consider myself a fan, even though we're, you know, at the time we were, we were at the highest level of both of our games. Um, that is just it, my mindset kind of worked that way. And it's kind of weird. That's incredible. Um, Buck Showalter. Uh, he was your manager in Baltimore. Do you, do you have a favorite, you know, maybe memory or interaction? Did, were you ever in the dugout where he was screaming at an umpire? Does does anything like that stand out for Buck? Um, well, Buck was always interesting in, in uh, before the games. He'd always walk around to to the outfield, and he'd, he'd always have these like either clever plays or or something just off the wall that like, yeah, hey, you ever think about this and. And, you know, be where the, the runner would go on a walk, you know, he'd walk and he'd just start running out the to center field. And he's like, what do you think they do? <laughs> just different, different situations like that, where he'd come up and he'd be like, how do you think of this stuff? Um, but the one funny thing that, that I, uh, I always kind of didn't know happened at the time, but we were in Oakland and I, uh, he had an intentional walk. Uh, we, I think we were walking um, Cespedes and we still had to throw it at that time. And my first pitch went over Weeder's head and hit the backstop at Oakland. Um, so obviously that's, um, and during on the broadcast, it, it, he gave this face that uh, was like, I don't know how that happened. Uh, obviously I didn't know that <laughs> happened until afterwards. Um, but then I, he, he, he did give the sign for, uh, for a, four more pitches or three more pitches. Cause I still had to walk them. Um, and so I, you know, I had to make sure that I threw those next three, uh, two weeders. Um, <laughs> but that, that was kind of pretty funny that I found out afterwards. Oh, he was the most expressionistic manager of, of all time. Maybe just a little sly smirk or he'd, he'd be sitting in the dugout, the yep. camera would cut to him and he, he'd have his legs crossed and just kind of be over here like thinking, gosh, yeah, yep. that's, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, um, the last one I had for you, uh, you were there that first month that Manny Machado was a major leaguer back in August of 12. Um, how like, like what is it? What is it like being there from the beginning and then seeing what he's turned into now? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but uh, I actually got sent down for Manny when he first <laughs> came up. Um, I was the transaction for for him. Um, I pitched my first game, uh, my first start one, and then I came into the clubhouse the next day, and and he's sitting there, and and uh, I was the guy that got sent down. Um, but then I was up like three or four days later because someone got hurt. Um, but I missed his first couple games. Obviously, I saw a couple after that uh, being with the team for the rest of 2012. Um, but obviously, he's he's you could tell he was a great player then as a rookie, um, being on, a, on the team with him, knowing that any ball that he got sent his way, he was going to make that play easily. Um, really, you know, we were pretty lucky as um, to have, you know, Manny, Hardy, Scope, you know, guys like that playing, playing the infield for us. We were pretty lucky, but... Uh, yeah, it, he's obviously turned into a, a, an absolute superstar and, um, you know, been paid accordingly. And, uh, you know, it's just been happy to, to kind of see him grow as a player and then uh, kind of battle through some of those tough times through different teams and then uh, you know, find, his, find his home in San Diego, obviously, um, 
doing pretty well there over the last couple of years. So uh, it's good to see. It's 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 fun to be able to tell people that I got sent down for him. He has one tr transaction in the big leagues pretty much, and um, I'll always be pretty much attached to him. So it's kind of funny. I, I'm so mad I didn't know that. I, I did see that. Yeah, I did see that <laughs> transaction, but I didn't know who it was for. Dang, that's so funny, though. Um, Steve, this has been incredible. Thank you so much for coming on here. Um, we know I'd love to get you back on the pod again sometime to talk more pitching fundamentals and anything that else pops up along the way in Birdland. But, uh, oh, last, last thing. Um, you are, you, are you the owner of uh, your, your baseball training facility outside of Baltimore? Uh, wh what is that called and where can people find I it? I am. It's Optimal Baseball Performance. They can go to OptimalBaseball.com. Uh, um, Right now, it's just a Facebook website, but I'm getting that website kind of up and running. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they can contact me there, email me at optimalbaseball at gmail.com if they have any questions about anything. But, yeah, it's been it's been fun the last couple of years, really kind of helping these guys kind of grow into uh, their own players and um, been able to see their games recently in the, in the spring, uh, kind of putting their hard work to the, uh, to the test. Uh, so it's been fun kind of uh, having these guys kind of get older and, and uh, get better. So it's been, it's been a lot of fun. No doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody in the, in the Baltimore area, hit up Steve. He's the guy. So, uh, all right. Thank you, sir. And uh, yeah, hopefully talk soon.